Welcome everybody. Bienvenue. Herzlich willkommen. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a Co, which will be the setting online but also here in presence of this World Summit on Frontline Humanitarian Negotiation and of the Fifth General Assembly of the Community of Practice of CCHN. As initiatives of change, we're very proud to support our partner with this summit after many years of fruitful collaboration and it's especially timely as we are also celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. Some of you might have been here before in one of the CCHN retreats and you might agree with me that Co is a special place. Of course, it is majestic and grand, has an amazing view on the mountains and on the lake. And some might say that it's a bit over the top to talk about humanitarian issues. But this isn't just a palace. Like many things in life, it is much more than what it just seems. So let me tell you a little bit more about the story of this place. It started as the most luxurious place, Grand Hotel in Europe. It was built in 1902. It was the place for the rich of the famous then. But this Grand Hotel didn't survive two world wars and was bankrupt by the second one. It then housed prisoners of wars and Jewish refugees. As the war ended, it was meant to be destroyed. But just then, a group of individuals and of Swiss uh, families decided to make this place a center for reconciliation and dialogue to rebuild trust after the war. And with the motto that we all have a role to play to make this world a better place. And this was in 1946, 75 years ago. Since then, this grand hotel turned refugee center, turned dialogue and conference center of a worldwide movement of initiatives of change has housed every summer many delegations from around the world to build peace and trust across the world's divides. The Initiatives of Change Network and community of change makers and peace builders from across the globe see this place as their home, as a safe space to gain perspective, be resourced, to learn, to be inspired, and to connect to others, building a community to serve the world and make this world a better place. And now it is also yours. May Co, online, but also here offline, bring you the environment you need for fruitful exchanges, inspiration, and connection to others, but also to yourself. Thank you to all the CCHN team and to you uh, present here for making our 75th anniversary special and to bring a little more piece of it in history. And also thank you for the new yurt and the garden, Claude. <laughs> Wishing you a good event, thank you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to welcome you at the 2021 CCHN World Summit on Frontline Humanitarian Negotiation, live stream from this incredible location in Co. A location dear to us, thanks to our standing cooperation with Initiative of Change. We have for you an extraordinary agenda this week involving more than 50 distinct workshop, thematic sessions, simulation, community assembly, and exhibit. We're very much, we very much hope that the Co-Palace and the CCHN global digital platform will provide a conducive environment for exchange of experience on negotiation and connect with colleagues from around the world. The 2021 World Summit represent an important moment for the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation. It marks five years of intense labor and commitment in fostering a safe space for exchanging humanitarian experience and practices. Thanks to the support of our strategic partner, that is the ICRC, the World Food Programme, UNHCR, 
MSF, and HD, the CCHN has been able to engage with over 2,000 professionals, frontline humanitarian practitioners working in you know, seeking access to population affected by armed conflict. And doing so, learning from their negotiation experience, analyzing their practices, and reflecting with them on the recurring challenges and dilemmas of humanitarian access. The World Summit is a moment to celebrate this collaborative effort and to address some of the most complex and intractable humanitarian challenges of our times. I am particularly pleased to welcome the members of the CCHN Community of Practice for their fifth annual assembly. Launched in 2016, the CCHN Community of Practice gathers professionals from across the humanitarian sector, willing to learn from peers and providing advice in the conduct, in the conduct of humanitarian negotiation in complex environments. But I would like also to make a pause here. As you can imagine, the loss of colleagues and friends on duty always represent a sad and tragic moment for the members of our community and also a moment of reflection on our practices. While we've been preparing for this summit as a celebration, we learn of the death of Maria Hernandez Mata, who has been an active member of the CCHN community since 2019. She was deployed with MSF with colleagues in Ethiopia. Maria and two of her colleagues, Tedros Gebri Marian and Gebri Michael and Johannes Alefom Redda, were murdered in an attack on last Friday, delivering assistance to conflict-affected population in Tigre. We send our most sincere thoughts and condolence to Maria's, Tedros, and Johannes' families and to our colleagues at MSF. This attack is a tragic reminder of the risk humanitarian workers around the world are exposed to and the critical importance frontline actors to have safe access to the communities with which they work. I propose a moment of silence to honor their commitment please. Thank you. It's also a great honor to welcome other humanitarian development and peace building professionals who are joining us uh, during this week to contribute and reflect on the challenges of humanitarian negotiation and in the development of new tools to help practitioners in the field in securing their access. Allow me to express my sincere appreciation to the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, who is providing financial support to this conference. And that has accompanied the piloting of the CCHN since its early inception in 2015. We're also grateful for the support to all our donors, in particular the ICRC, WFP, the German, Swedish, Luxembourg, and Norwegian governments who have understood from the start of the importance of contributing to the emergence of this community of practice. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all our donors, stakeholders, and contributors for their trust in the CCHN, especially as we explore the various ways of pursuing our mission in this digitalized new world. Over a thousand field practitioners have engaged with their peers via CCHN digital platforms since the onset of the pandemic, involving a growing share of women and national staff, most of them directly from their respective field location. The great success has been made possible thanks to the collective efforts of our donor, the CCHN team, our over 200 facilitators, and 2,000 members of our community of practice. We will be focusing the 2021 World Summit on our core mission. That is to foster 
promote and support peer-to-peer -peer collaboration among humanitarian negotiators on the front line. We believe that the time has come to invest in the collaborative nature of frontline humanitarian negotiation. While humanitarian operations have grown exponentially over the recent years, most frontline practitioners are working in isolation from each other with few changes to engage and share experience across agencies. Agencies and NGOs too often negotiate by themselves with the same interlocutors on the same issues with limited space to reflect on their plans and to learn from each other. Furthermore, many field practitioners have yet to receive a formal training on humanitarian negotiation or be equipped with the required tools to plan and review their engagement in a systematic manner. As humanitarian systems are becoming more sophisticated, we need to focus our attention on the capacity of organization to plan negotiation processes effectively and leverage their influence through the multiple humanitarian interaction with the counterparts in complex emergencies. These questions and many other will be examined during the 2021 CCHN World Summit. I invite you all to engage with the speakers, contribute to the discussion, and challenge their ideas. The World Summit is an open space for professionals to engage, to deliberate, and to put things into questions. Some of them managed to come to CO, and I'd like to welcome them here. Sylvester from Nigeria, Fetnat from Syria, Adrenina from Venezuela. We wish many more would have joined us, and maybe next year we'll have many more coming. Before giving the floor to our keynote speaker, I would like here to give a space for the voice of our colleagues, frontline practitioners that have prepared this short video to greet you all at the World Summit. Thank you. The situations that we see today around the world, situation of humanitarian crisis, we see they are becoming more and more complex. You may face a situation in Afghanistan that perhaps people in Nigeria may face, for example. Maybe we are working in the same sector and field, but we don't know each other. In, in, in el terreno, tendemos a, a ser como islas. Las respuestas que teníamos para las preguntas tradicionales ya no logren satisfacernos. We are working in different contexts, but we are uh, facing similar uh, challenges and dilemmas. The most important strength of CCHN uh, is its members, uh, the community. Déjà, le, la raison d'être du CCHN est un symbole fort d'une volonté de rassemblement, d'une volonté euh, d'avoir des approches communes. Nous avons permis aussi de nous brosser à des gens qui viennent d'origines différentes, euh, de sensibilités différentes, d'organisations différentes, c'est-à-dire qui ont des, des mandataires, qui ont des visions politiques différentes, mais euh, dans une volonté d'avoir une approche commune. Une des choses que j'ai appris dans le centre de l'année passée, es que la negociación y el acceso no se improvisan, se tiene que esquematizar. Hoy en día tengo unas herramientas que me permiten a mí tener un esquema. I think the solution to that is collaboration, it's solidarity, and it's always putting human beings in the center of our negotiations. Having a collaborative approach will help us to, uh, to let's say, exchange experiences, okay, about different contexts, but maybe find solutions. La labor del centro, del CCNH, favorece el enfoque colectivo en la medida que pone en contacto a trabajadores y trabajadoras del mundo humanitario con diferentes experiencias les brinda herramientas concretas que fundamentalmente se basan en la experiencia. El centro es un espacio de encuentro, de diálogo, de pensar también cómo abordar los desafíos del presente y también del futuro. And this is what CCHN uh, created, building a bridge between these practitioners so they can share their experiences and not feeling that they are by themselves. CCHN created also a personal space for us 
to do and to express yourself and what you are going through in the humanitarian field, it's very important for your psyche and for your even mental health. Regrouper des acteurs comme le mouvement de la Croix-Rouge, le système des Nations Unies et d'autres ONG, organisations non gouvernementales, c'est déjà montrer un symbole d'ouverture et de d'unicité, cet ensemble de couverture mondiale et d'ancrage local qui fera avancer en fait le monde humanitaire. Nadie se salva solo ni nadie puede salvar solo a nadie. Eh, es únicamente trabajando en conjunto al que podemos encontrar eh, soluciones concretas. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, sincerely thank and appreciate all the organizations contributing to uh, CCHAN. Los grandes jugadores son quienes meten goles. Los equipos son los que ganan los partidos. Es con un enfoque colaborativo, cooperativo, que vamos a poder eh, lograr nuestro mandato humanitario. I would like now to welcome Mrs. Barbel Koffler, Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance of the German government. It is a renewed pleasure to welcome Mrs. Koffler who opened the previous conference of the CCHN in Berlin in November 2019. Thank you for joining us and for your continued interest and support in this endeavor. Mrs. Koffler. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of you, dear Claude Brüderlein, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Yes, you were pointing out that it's now been roughly one and a half years since I had the chance to uh, literally stand before you at the conference uh, on building the capacity of frontline, uh, frontline humanitarian organizations in Berlin. And I would really have loved to see you all in person and get personally engaged with you. I hope it is soon possible again and we soon can all meet up uh, in person again. Well, back in 2019, I expressed our concern about the shrinking humanitarian space. And unfortunately, this still holds true today. Today, humanitarian space is under unprecedented pressure. And as we heard just in the re opening remarks of Claude Bruderlein, attacks on humanitarian personnel have reached unprecedented levels. And I also really want to point that out. I think we all think of those humanitarian workers murdered in Tigray last week. I have very sincere feel with their families, their friends, their colleagues. Such horrendous crimes must end. I fully concur with UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres, who said that this is totally unacceptable and an appalling violation of international humanitarian law. Well, next to those shameful attacks, the COVID-19 pandemic has further contributed to the shrinking humanitarian space. Containment measures, restrictions of movement and border closures have been imposed around the world. So the deployment of humanitarian workers and supplies has become more difficult. Conflict zones or regions under the control of armed non-state actors are the most difficult areas in which to stage a COVID response. But last but not least, population affected by the pandemic to perceive humanitarian workers as possible carriers of the virus. In these challenging times, through our UN Security Council membership and our presidency of the Council of Europe, um, of the Council of the uh, European Union, Germany has pushed for concrete measures to better protect the humanitarian space and especially to highlight the challenges for humanitarian access during the pandemic. The Franco-German call for action to strengthen respect for international humanitarian law and principled humanitarian action was one of the highlights of German's recent membership of the UN Secretary Council with a sustained impact. It entails and guides our vision on humanitarian negotiations. Together with the other signatories, we have pledged to support humanitarian organizations in building up capacities for humanitarian negotiations. 
our con uh, continuous funding of CCH, CCHN is indeed a tangible measure for our commitment. During our presidency of the Council of the European Union, we put the topic of Corona diplomacy on the EU's agenda, together with the ICRC, to which I would like explicitly to express Germany's gratitude for the effort and the hard work we called on all member states in the Working Group on Humanitarian Aid and Food Aid to take adequate measures aimed at mitigating the effects of the pandemic on humanitarian assistance. Well, however, I'm actually aware that humanitarian space cannot just be protected in New York, Brussels or Berlin. First and foremost, it needs to be preserved and expanded in the field. And I very lively still remember uh, an encounter with the field operation manager in South Sudan. He told us in the dialogue we had, I think it was my last trip I could make to Geneva. He told us in the dialogue about the illegal checkpoints manned by armed non-state groups impeding the delivery of humanitarian assistance and endangering his life and the life of his colleagues. Well, without his negotiation skills, he would not have been able to master such dangerous situations and carry out his indispensable work. However, it is not enough simply to applaud the courage and the profound personal commitment of humanitarian workers, like the skilled negotiators I just mentioned. We do have a moral obligation to support and protect you as well as possible in your difficult task. This entails uh, your personal security, equipment, and communication, but it also means helping you by further improving your individual negotiation skills. This is essential in order to ensure access in difficult situations, because without access, humanitarian assistance does not reach those in need. It is exactly for these reasons that your work of providing humanitarian negotiation skills is absolutely key. When I visited CCHN's headquarters early last year, you, Peter, told me how humanitarian assistance has been prof uh, professionalized. The one sub subject you felt was lagging behind was humanitarian negotiations. And Claude, you mentioned that there were about 10,000 untrained negotiators out there in the field, just following their good instinct. This needed and increased urgency still needs to change. Therefore, I very much appreciate the extremely valuable work CCHN has been doing for the five years now. And I want to thank you for all the hard work you have put enhanced in, into enhanced collaborative engagement on the front lines. Germany's support for the CCHN is also an expression of our appreciation for your most valuable work. Opening up activities and events to all fields practitioners engaged in frontline negotiations has been one huge step in enhancing this collaboration. Another huge step was the endorsement of the common vision on humanitarian negotiations by the high level panel during the 2019 Berlin conference. I would like to highlight one of the demands raised in the common vision because it is central to our vision on promoting collaborative approaches on the uh, front lines. Sharing negotiation tools and capacity access agencies in view of their growing in the, in the interdependence in terms of safe and principled access. I understand that there is a strong, what you would call corporate culture in every humanitarian organization. These corporate cultures are valuable. They provide us with different perspectives, different approaches. However, we need to avoid thinking in organizational silos. We do need to reinvent re the wheel. Uh, we do not need to reinvent the wheel in every crisis, every context. This would not only be ineffective, it would not only put additional stress on already strained budgets, in humanitarian frontline negotiations, avoiding unnecessary error means staying alive. Claude, you and your wonderful team have put in place standardized tools to master dangerous situations, thereby enabling the delivery of humanitarian assistance. You can rely on our continued support. 
Ladies and gentlemen, far too often, you are the unsung theorists, you are the unsung heroes of humanitarian assistance. Therefore, please allow me expressly to thank you most sincerely for all this essential work you are doing. Humanitarian assistance depend on your work and we depend all on your work. Thank you very much for your attendance and thank you very much for your work. And I'm very keen to hear from you from the field, from the practice on the ongoing debate, how we can do better in uh, fostering negotiation tools of human front, humanitarian workers. Well, thanks again and uh, may you have a good conference. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Koffler. Thank you for your words of support. I think the whole community of the CCHN is here to uh, hear you and benefit from your advice, the accompaniment of the German government of this process since 2029 has been a great asset of our effort, as well as the other donor governments and agencies who have partnered with the CCHN. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. That concludes the opening ceremony. I would like to welcome the high-level panel to join me on stage. I will give the floor to Rainer Gude, who will moderate the next event. Rainer. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. We know we're being followed by people from around the world. Delighted to have you here at the CCHN World Summit and welcome to our high-level panel. As Claude said, my name is Rainer Gude, Executive Coordinator at the Geneva Peace Building Platform, but I also worked for nine years with Initiatives of Change, the organization that holds the, the, and hosts this space, spent many times, over a hundred different times I counted, in this room and it's a pleasure to be back here. It's my pleasure and honor to moderate this panel. It's also my challenge to moderate such an illustrious panel with so little time. We've apologized to them beforehand, but in fact, this is not going to be one big conversation. This is a conversation starter. We have some interesting questions for them, but they're here to get us thinking, to set the tone, to be a bit of a teaser for what is to come. There will be round tables, in, after this session and of course wonderful conversations uh, all throughout the week and indeed this is a conversation that will go beyond that. So um, we have three panelists here with us today and another five online. It is truly a hybrid experience and we're uh, proud to be pioneering in this uh, in this building. We will not be reading out their illustrious CVs. You can check that out online. I'll giving them short introductions and uh, I apologize to them already is I am also the timekeeper and maybe needing to keep things moving along. Uh, to all of those following online, please do send your comments, your questions. Again, we can probably not answer all of them, but we're delighted to have you part of the discussion and one of our colleagues will be feeding back from your uh, discussions, from your comments to the panel and we will try to answer them. But again, the real conversation will continue throughout this week. With that being said, I would like to start here on my left, Peter Maurer, President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Why don't you set the tone? Our, the title is Designing Collaborative Approaches to Global Humanitarian Challenges. What are collaborative approaches? What do they look like to you? What opportunities do we have with them? And how else would you like to set us off on this day? Thanks a lot, uh, Rainer, but uh, let me just before responding thank, uh, of course, Stephanie Bori of Initiative and Change of hosting us today, the Swiss government, for the great support of this event and first and foremost, very frankly, CCHN's team who has tirelessly prepared this event and uh, has done that uh, beside the regular job of supporting frontline uh, negotiations. So thanks a lot uh, to all of you for having us today. I think it is an important moment of celebrating this community of practice that has emerged over the last couple of years and a good moment of connections and fostering further connections during the week. Uh, Rainer, uh, 
I think one of the most easy issue to address in the humanitarian field is really the issue of cooperation and collaboration and it's at the same time the most difficult to solve because what we see in particular in the humanitarian field and I have worked in my life in other fields is how much humanitarian responses are fragmented and how difficult it is amongst humanitarian organizations and actors to create an atmosphere of trust and collaboration. While institutions in particular since the beginning of the millennium have considerably increased their coordination and cooperation schemes, whether they are state-based or international organization and NGOs, as institutions have collaborated, people within institutions, actors at front lines, have not followed pace and their collaboration has been rather fragmentary over the last 20 years. And I think this is counterintuitive to a certain extent because if we look at the problem landscape, and I found the video at the beginning very illustrative. If we look at the problem landscape, the protractedness and vulnerability of protractedness of conflict, the vulnerability and fragility of context in which we are, this that sort of dominant security challenges with which we are confronted, all of us independently on which organization we are working for. The trend towards accountability in society, which demands from all of us impact and not just uh, uh, work as we are used to deliver. The digital transformation also, which has obviously flattened the world and facilitated collaboration, all these trends demand for more collaboration amongst individuals. And I think we have seen over the last five years in CCHN how the interest has grown to common analysis and of context, to mapping networks of influences, to also understand through collaboration and uh, amongst individuals and amongst frontliners to understand the difficulties and the challenges of this frontline negotiation. So, I have the impression the question today is not anymore after five years if we collaborate as individuals and coordinate as institutions. The question is how do we do it and how do we balance cooperation and coordination of institutions with collaborations of individuals within those institutions. And I must say as a president of ICRC, what has fascinated me most since I came to the organization was the power of collaboration between dedicated professionals. And while forensic experts, water engineers, uh, surgeons have already built those networks for decades, and they meet, cooperate, coordinate, and collaborate as individuals within their institutions, frontline negotiation negotiators didn't. And I think what struck me is the power of talking to prison directors who for decades have collaborated in informal networks and how much they were able within their institutions to advance a better and more fluid and more impactful work as prison director, forensic experts and war surgeons. And I think that's where frontline negotiators have to keep up and where I think this is so fascinating to listen in the future to this panel, but then also to the panel during the week where we look more concretely in the workshop what kind of tools what kind of uh, instruments that we are able to create to foster uh, such collaboration. I wanted also to say that there is a delicate balance to find during this week and I hope 
you all can help us finding this balance. This is not sort of playing individuals against institutions or playing institutional collaboration and coordination against individuals. It's finding the right balance and accentuation. It's finding the right bridges and interactions. And I think this is what CCHN hopes to be and hopes to do, to be a platform where institutions who are interested and who are frontline institutions meet individuals going beyond institutions, beyond contexts, beyond fragmentations, and to find the right balance and articulations of people and institutions is what I think the next mutation of CCHN should look like. Maybe a last word just to say, announce that with our core, uh, with our uh, core partners in having created CCHN and with the community of practice, we hope to find the right formula of, on moving from a pilot project that CCHN was within ICRC to a stronger institutional and platform fit up where the founding institutions of CCHN as well as the community of practice can find a home to further develop the skills, the capacities of these communities. That's a little bit in a short version my vision on where I see us going and where I see the strong interest and the commitment I have to work together <coughs> with all of you and finding basically a new deal and a new mutation of this form of collaboration on frontline negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for setting us off. We would now like to go to one of our online panelists and uh, in our hybrid panel, we would like to go to David Katrud, World Food Program, Director of Program in Humanitarian and Development Division. And David, I hope you're with us. Never yes, have a panel without... Me? Perfect. Uh, never have a panel without at least some uh, technical issues. So great, great to have you here. And so we've heard a little bit about collaborative approaches, but what is a collaborative culture? And how may it complement and support coordination? And yes, glad to hear you and welcome to our panel. Well, thank you so much, uh, Reiner, and uh, just an overall thanks to Claude and the CCH team and to the Swiss government for making this uh, really important event happen. Uh, quick apologies from our executive director who would have liked to have uh, been on this panel, probably physically even, uh, and also Valerie Guignari, who I think was with you last uh, time. I'm acting in Valerie's uh, stead today, so, um, and, but I'm also the Director of Humanitarian Development, our programming division here, and very pleased to be with you. And I know we're, we're a bit limited on time. Uh, I couldn't agree, agree more with what we've heard from um, Peter just now in terms of there is a distinction of the collaborative uh, issue uh, uh, approach as you know on individuals and relationships and uh, a more personal approach and the necessary evil of coordination at all levels uh, which uh, we we uh, contend with in a kind of a tension there and I do feel that going forward the evolution of this CCHN approach uh, will of course uh, take that on in the area of, of, of access um, in terms of of how we engender that um, in perspective from WFP, which we're redoubling our efforts on access this year. We've um, uh, recently issued a, a reissued a corporate approach to access. We're uh, strengthening our internal coordinations. So we're really thinking through these issues and making the most of our partnership with CCHN. And indeed, we are, are as, as speakers have said so far, we're keeping the orientation to the field where tailored approaches of more collaborative, collaborative nature are quite important, while at the same time we complement with coordination mechanisms, both at country level, but also uh, internationally. And there's some efforts there that are intensifying, which we can comment on during the, the next couple of days, both with OCHA and also with the 2417 uh, resolution in the Security Council. These are tools that can be used to enhance what, what ultimately goes on on the ground. In terms of collaboration, um, for us, it starts with uh, the ingredients are shared values, which of course in this context are the tried and true humanitarian principles and how they're applied. Collaboration means networking, 
of, of uh, like-minded individuals. CCHN has, has uh, helped tremendously on that. And we, through our network of partners that work with us, uh, and this is a growing set of partnering that is uh, contending with uh, really challenging situations uh, in terms of humanitarian response, we leverage that net network also uh, in a collaborative way to, to address access issues. Other ingredients are knowledge, uh, best practices, CCHN, WFP, and others, of course, generate these best practices worldwide. And the key is making sure that we can develop them and disseminate them through this network. And of course, in the process, train uh, uh, more and more individuals, uh, because as was said earlier, we still uh, do have a long way to go to get uh, uh, kind of a, a standard approach uh, to this issue across the thousands of, of people that find themselves negotiating. Now, uh, one so on collaboration, uh, we feel that it's not only internal uh, and with with uh, humanitarian practitioners, but we also are trying to extend it where possible in a kind of community acceptance approach. It's collaboration with communities ultimately that furthers the acceptance issue that will enhance our negotiation work, our contributions to peace, and so on. So this is a dimension we might also explore on how to engender that type of collaboration at that community level. Uh, beyond the humanitarian practitioners as they get stronger and stronger. Now, one area that uh, we also uh, are spending a lot of time on for us as we move from collaboration to that, uh, as I said, uh, necessary evil of, of structured coordination, there is coherence. We're, this is a very important concept for us. And what we found internally, and we would think this is uh, uh, apropos to all uh, entities involved in access negotiations beyond the individuals, the actual organizations they work for, there's a coherence issue because we find ourselves with security officers, with logisticians, with uh, even legal personnel and program personnel all engaging in negotiations, but not necessarily being as as joined up as, as possible. And so one area that might be worth exploring is making sure that agencies also get a kind of a consistent level of coherence, internal coherence, as we uh, approach the uh, uh, working together in this area of, of uh, negotiation uh, at the ground level. And so we're, we're re renewing some of our, in, our efforts to get that coherence internally, whether it's through training uh, or through coordination mechanisms internal, to make sure that those different actors are aware of, of uh, the, the best practices and uh, and their role in uh, access negotiations, particularly at the ground and field level. Also related to coherence for us, uh, and this gets us closer to the coordination dilemmas, is we are have always been careful to uh, not to promote joined up action because uh, the trust that we have with collaboration doesn't necessarily mean that we have to pursue negotiations in a joined, uh, jointly coordinated manner uh, we, or a joint manner. Uh, this happens quite a bit in humanitarian country teams and, and with humanitarian coordinators that oftentimes find themselves, uh, you know, positioning themselves as a kind of a single negotiator. Rather, what we promote is coherence from a strategic point of view, strategic coherence, but operational independence would be a mantra that WFP offers as we, we grapple with this issue of collaboration vis-a-vis coordination structures. And it's still an art, it's still something we're learning, but it is a principle that we, how we approach this so that we get the most out of tailored approaches, out of actors that can act operationally or in better position to act operationally in a certain very local context, but within an overall strategic framework that may have been developed at the country level or even more broadly. So this is something we might want to explore earlier, uh, later, it's been around for a while, and it is definitely part of our orientation. I think what I'll finish with is um, for supporting both collaboration, uh, coherence, and also um, uh, coordination is increasingly not only knowledge on best practices, but also information. And this has been touched on. We, we do a fairly good job of, con uh, of, of, of uh, a situational analysis and assessment, but this is more challenged now under this complex uh, uh, period we're, we're facing now post COVID, but with this um, uh, continual march uh, on with the climate crisis, we have climate and conflict drivers that are blending and merging. 
in many of these environments. And we uh, also, in, in our case, are doubling down on this analytical capacity to, to get a sense of this uh, risk analysis based by these multiple drivers, which include uh, COVID and its socioeconomic effects at this point. So uh, uh, in, in supporting collaboration and ultimately coordination, uh, we should also invest in uh, knowledge sharing or information sharing, particularly uh, on the con con uh, context specific uh, information analysis that we're all generating. And a very final point is as we do all of this and we, and we hopefully are successful, we are in WFP also making sure that we can live up to whatever expectations that we would have in, uh, engendered with communities and actors and there is this issue of how to deliver on the access dividend. That is the actual humanitarian assistance in this era of competing resourcing, uh, uh, you know, and uh, across uh, various uh, uh, demands and the prioritization. So there, because if we do gain access in any one environment, there has to be sustained delivery thereafter. So we also want to make sure as part of our coherence that we're, we're very well teamed up with uh, supplies and uh, supply chains and others that can deliver this assistance that we're actually negotiating access for. So let me stop there, uh, Reiner. That was just a few thoughts. I'm sure we can build on them and uh, not just now, but also throughout the week. So thank you so much. Th th thank you so much, David, for packing quite a lot into a short amount of time. We see our vocabulary is expanding and we see also that that vocabulary is a, is a work in progress. Uh, a lot of these terms are things that are being negotiated uh, regularly and we're understanding more well, what is the borders between coordination and collaboration, but it looks like we'll go in more into that now um, across the rest of this week. But what I'd like to do is take this to another person, another panelist uh, who is online, Dr. Asha Mohammed, from the Secretary General of the Kenyan Red Cross. Great to have you with us. And so we heard a lot of different inputs so far, quick ones, they would all merit <laughs> a lot more discussion. But what we realize is that a lot of things aren't necessarily as structured and go forward also with informal dialogues among field practitioners. So Dr. Mohammed, could you tell us how could these informal dialogues among practitioners contribute to the development of a common negotiation strategies that can assist ultimately the populations in need? Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much uh, also for having me and um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, high level panel um, and, and I'm really glad that the issue of informal dialogue is brought on the table because I think one of the things we need to demystify that uh, humanitarian negotiation does not necessarily always have to be uh, have, have to work through a systematic approach and has to work through a formal uh, system because uh, uh, Many times I think this is a bit of the misnomer that um, people are in the field feel like they, they do not have, uh, of course, the mandate to negotiate and it has to come from the offices or the seniors in that respect. So uh, very happy to see this being brought on the table. I think for me, there's um, enough um, compelling evidence that uh, we have many opportunities to collaborate even without uh, formal agreements. And this is really based on goodwill and uh, the fact that we, if we have a common goal in terms of supporting communities, uh, then we will find it even much easier to be able to do this. We have a lot of formal structures, both at global, national, but also even at uh, some of the community levels. Uh, but sometimes you find that uh, many of the representatives in these formal structures are very far removed from the reality of what is happening on the ground. And therefore, uh, again, very important to really have, uh, you know, the frontline actors themselves also participating directly. Uh, we've also uh, seen that uh, a lot of times the informal dialogue that is done away from the boardrooms and conferences can help, uh, you know, go a long way because it helps to promote relationships, it helps to build trust, uh, and respect also amongst uh, the different uh, actors, uh, including CSOs, government agencies, uh, security forces, but also even the communities, because then there is a better understanding of the different roles and uh, hence the support uh, to facilitate this is very uh, welcoming. There's also the question of building credibility. And uh, I think it's, it's very important that uh, through informal dialogue, we've seen that uh, people are able to uh, 
earn this with the interlocutors because they are able to engage and uh, the other parties can actually see that, yes, there is um, an important uh, aspect here to be able to work on together. For me as well, I think what is important is really uh, the question of the frontline actors themselves. And um, I think uh, Claude mentioned this also in his uh, opening statement is uh, in terms of capacity, because uh, Sometimes people are put also in positions uh, where then they find that they probably do not have the necessary uh, capacity to be able actually to do a good negotiation and therefore the capacity building of organizations and also frontline actors I think is very key and that's why the work that the CCHN is doing I think is, is commendable and should be supported. Uh, I think on the global part as well is uh, and also through CCHN is to try and demystify demystify humanitarian negotiations, uh, like I said, is that we all have a role to play and it does not necessarily mean that this can only be done by a few people and it can also only be done by people at a certain level within our institutions or even within the humanitarian network. So how do we uh, ensure then that uh, people in the front line, especially, or humanitarian organizations uh, appreciate and understand that uh, this is a very important role that has to be placed um, squarely also uh, in in the you can call it the job description of all humanitarian actors so that even as they continue to deliver services they also are conscious and know that they will be um, an important part in ensuring that actually this happened this happens i would like to probably just quickly use an example of uh, covid uh, to say that uh, I think COVID-19 has also shown us uh, how to do it and also how not to do it. We've seen a lot of collaboration around COVID-19 from the beginning uh, to date in terms of especially vaccination. But at the same time, I would say it has also shown us uh, what we shouldn't do. And one of uh, the key ones for me is really that, um, unfortunately, a lot of the collaboration we've seen around COVID-19 has been short-lived and also has been shifting. Uh, if I look at Kenya in particular, I think we had a lot of uh, platforms, we had a lot of um, uh, interesting networks that were formed in the beginning of the pandemic, but with time this have sort of fizzled out and they have maybe taken different shapes, uh, but also a uh, shifting aspect in terms of even the thematics. Today, I think the whole globe is talking about COVID-19 vaccination forgetting that we still have to really work on the preventive part, which is still the bigger part, because uh, until everyone gets vaccinated or until the majority gets vaccinated, to give us that hard immunity, uh, we know what that means uh, with the current situation we have. So the preventive aspect is still very key, but we don't seem to see um, a lot of uh, collaboration across that. I think people have moved. For us as even humanitarian organizations, it's very hard to get partners now to support uh, this very important aspect because everyone is just talking about vaccination. So I think even as we talk about, yes, collaborative approaches uh, and how we can uh, enhance this and the kind of tools we have, I think it's important to also uh, note and say that this needs to be sustained uh, for them to be effective uh, and they need therefore to be uh, nurtured and to be harnessed to be able to actually give us the kind of impact that we would want. So uh, I don't want to take a long time because I think uh, a lot of what I would have said has also, also been um, alluded to by the other uh, colleagues. But I think for me, what is key in terms of uh, informal dialogue is that uh, most importantly, it builds trust. And I think this is the biggest issue because when we come together to collaborate, uh, sometimes it can be a bit mechanical, but when we trust each other, then uh, we, we, we have the space to really go beyond uh, even some of what we may have uh, put as our objectives and might find ourselves actually really uh, doing well. So I think this is something that could be encouraged. Uh, I will not be able to conclude my remarks as well without uh, being a bit of an advocate here. And that is to say, we need to see more female humanitarian negotiators. I think this is important uh, and, for, and for very good reasons. We know negotiation skills, some of them are really, uh, I would say natural for women. And I think uh, women have, have some of those skills that uh, even the CCHN cannot teach. 
So maybe it's a challenge for all of us to see that we bring more female humanitarian negotiators on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohamed, uh, for uh, showing the importance of building trust, whether formally or informally. And very much thank you for your final comment, which uh, I believe both in our comments and in the room was met with a lot of welcome, <laughs> silent applause. But um, speaking of uh, the people following us online, I would like to turn to my colleague, Hanalia. Uh, what's going on in the chat? What are the comments? What do you hear coming through? Uh, thanks, Rainer, and thanks to the panelists. I think participants in the chat are just getting warmed up. Uh, there is a general acknowledgement that, of course, collaboration is uh, part of our ways of working, part of who we are as humanitarians. Um, and, and there's a general line of questioning around what would be the best platform, the best channel to boost collaboration amongst humanitarian agencies on the ground. Uh, we heard from one of the panelists about the need for more internal coherence, um, and, and participants in the chat are asking whether, you know, dedicated structures, platform in country level mm -hmm. clusters, working group would help doing this, keeping in mind that uh, there is a need for flexibility. Some of these collaborations need to be informal, others need to be more formal, uh, skills and credibility need to be developed. Um, so, and, and recognizing that CCHN can be one such platform, one such tools. This general line of questioning for the panelists uh, online and on the stage today is around how to actually make this happen, practically speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll get back to you uh, at the end. So coming back to us here in Co, I'd like to ask a panelist here present with us. I'd like to ask Granya O'Hara, Director of International Protection at UNHCR. You've heard uh, some of the different vocabulary words that have come up. How do you see this distinction or tension? It was, uh, sometimes it seemed even that it's quite contentious, the difference between collaborative culture and, and coordination. How do you see the relationship between the two? And, and if I could add to that, how can an agency also develop its own collaborative culture dealing with this, navigating between this tension, I would say? Glad to have you here. Thank you very much. And, uh that's an easy question. Yes, I, I figured I'd be easy on the you. The easiest question of the lot. Um, firstly, like my co-panelists, I'd very much like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for the invitation here. Um, I didn't know much about the history of this place and having learned yesterday the particular significance about it having been a, a, a refuge and a safe place for, for some of the Hungarian Jews, that's obviously very close to UNHCR's work and it was very moving. Uh, I've often looked up at this place from down below and wondered, what is that place? It looks... You are not the only one, it, it, it looks so beautiful, so it's a privilege to be here with you. Um, what can I say? The tensions between coordination and collaboration. Because I, I think sometimes we assume that they are the same thing and they come naturally to us. And just listening to some of the comments of my co-panelists, starting from what President Maurer was saying quite provocatively, that uh, in many ways maybe we're lagging behind. I, I, I found that a very good opening and, uh, and starter for us to question ourselves. Because we tend, I think, in the humanitarian community to think, well, we've been so many places, we face so many challenges, we've found solutions for everything, we, we must be out there ahead of everyone else. But in the brief example, Peter, that you, uh, that you set out, I mean, first I was thinking, where is he going with this? And then as I listened to you, I thought, <laughs> no, actually he's right. Because I think what we do a lot in the humanitarian community, which sometimes marks or or creates that tension between coordination and genuine collaboration is, we have a tendency, and, and, and I would put you in HCR forward to be a, an example, perhaps of the, the bad side of this, so I'm not accused by anyone here of pointing the finger at anyone else, but I think we do have a tendency to wrap ourselves in the cloak of our mandate with a, with a huge capital M. And when everyone is, is focused on what their mandate is and what they're going to deliver, some of the issues that we need to have a common understanding of and common levels of understanding and professional capacity such as, uh, such as negotiation skills 
yeah, maybe some of that has fallen through the cracks along the way. And an institution like CCHN is a good way of bridging some of the tensions that can come about between what is coordination, which I like the phrase that David used several times, the, the necessary evil of coordination, because once we get, and I'm speaking here primarily of, of the UN structures, but I think many of our, our NGO colleagues, our civil society colleagues that we work alongside in big emergencies, I'm, I'm looking at you, Stephen, because we create these massive monsters of of coordination and then sometimes I think we need to step back and go okay it's important to coordinate but is this genuine collaboration are we not still kind of battling with each other about what my mandate is what your mandate is and I think the value that an organization or a platform rather like CH, uh, CCHN brings is it gives us that space at least I feel that very much from the way UNHCR has approached our um, co-founding and now our participation moving onwards, it, it gives us a space where we don't have to compete. A, a space where we're, of course, we're always looking for more support, more funding, but I think a platform like CCHN allows us to go, okay, we've come into this together with a joint commitment that we collectively want to raise the capacity, professionalism, standards, and access of a greater number of our colleagues to a training, and not just the training, but the network, the peer support, all that comes with it, of being part of the community moving onwards after you've done some basic training. And I think it's, it's approaches like that that really allow us to decrease this tension between coordination, which itself has a very formal connotation in the humanitarian world, like UNHCR formally coordinates the, uh, the protection cluster and shelter and um, camp coordination and camp management, uh, and will fight to the death to, to, so that people recognize that that's our role, we lead there. But something like CCHN, it gives us a space to relax a bit and actually collaborate in a more genuine manner. And as we do so, as has been said by some others before me, we're generating efficiencies because we're not all in our own corner, you know, developing similar programs. So we're developing efficiencies around, you know, that the donors really want to hear, that uh, we're using um, scarce finances in an effective manner. And again, for UNHCR, and I, uh, I'll stop here, we've had internal trainings, and we still do. You know, it goes to also something David was saying about, you know, we want to have genuine collaboration, but we want also to have our own operational independence. And there may be things that we feel that we have to do as UNHCR, also around the training arena. But what I found very, very valuable about our um, cooperation, our participation, our collaboration under the banner of CCHN is, it's allowed our colleagues exposure to a much broader networks, network of peers and, and supporters moving forward. Much more beneficial that had, had we only been talking, training and building networks within the UNHCR circle. Because there again, in the external world where we use our mandate with a big M to, you know, to prove we own this space, if we're only doing things internally, we can become an echo chamber of our own institutional experience that tells us UNHCR is wonderful and you have to watch out for those ICRC people, sometimes they're a bit fishy, or you have to watch out for those WFP people. I think the the very mechanism, the way CCHN is, is designed, has given us a space where we can trust, and as a result of trust, the collaboration is more genuine. Thank you so much for that, and I, it's an interesting way of describing the mission of CCHN, not only the building, the trust that you said between institutions, but also a place where we can relax together. I think uh, we like that. I think that fits here in Co. And uh, you did point to Stephen before, so I might as well do the same. She, she, she did ask if she could trust the ICRC or WFP, but she didn't question if she could trust the MSF people, but we'll, we're going to get to that now. So uh, Stephen Cornish, Director General, MSF Switzerland. Why don't we go a little bit deeper in this conversation? Again, we're a lot of food for thought here, but why don't you add to it? How would you classify these risks and restraints then of all that we're talking about here, collaboration? 
Well, good morning to everyone and, and thank you also to the organizers. Uh, very pleased to be here on what is the fifth uh, anniversary of C CHN as one of the founding partners. And it's perhaps interesting that you've asked me to speak on risks and constraints as perhaps the uh, unofficial contrarian in the room, uh, given MSF's long history of joining and leaving global cooperations. And I think we've definitely uh, seen the value of some global cooperations when we look at the, the sphere standards, for example, that have raised all of our game and set uh, minimum standards, uh, brought dignity to our patients, uh, increased our abilities, I think, across the sector. But interestingly enough, even agreeing on liters per water per day or kilocalories per day, which are scientific and medical, uh, were not uncontentious and were fraught uh, at one stage in trying to come to agreement around what the gold standards are. And um, I think in, in that respect, there is uh, this tension between what is the group and the peer learning and the uh, practice building, and what is the tools and the level setting and the accreditation, and how do those things marry together? And a gold standard in itself sounds like a very good idea. Um, and it might even be what's going to happen. It might be an outcome of the success of, uh, of this initiative. But what if that gold standard then becomes a barrier? What if insurers, uh, governments, organizations mandate a certain level uh, in order to be in a certain place? Might it become a barrier? Might it become an imposition? Uh, I don't know, but it's certainly, I think, something that, that we might want to reflect on. And, and if it does, uh, does that bring with it risks? Uh, risks of responsibility when uh, a trial and error tool fails or succeeds? Uh, risks of accountability uh, in front of an insurer or a government? Does it become a barrier to exclude the ability to send field workers to certain places if they haven't reached a certain uh, level of training? Um, these are questions I think that, uh, that we should be asking ourselves as we find the next uh, iteration of where we're going to go from here. And I think uh, a risk and a, and a constraint is even having a, a group uh, such as MSF who loves to leave these types of collaborations, but I'm very pleased to say that uh, while I'm standing, sitting here, I guess, alone uh, from MSF, we have 200 collaborators across uh, around the world who are following uh, different iterations of this summit over the next week. And I think there's something uh, for us to learn from them on this balance between coordination, collaboration, between the formal that you've mentioned uh, and that uh, WFP also mentioned, this, this formalization of a practice or of a toolkit versus the informal value of, we heard this last night, of storytelling, of exchange. Uh, where is the true richness when you're trying to learn a practice? Uh, and that's a, that's a question for us. There was also a question uh, last night raised around the domain uh, and, and how it is in some sense becoming a bit more fragmented with subdomains of different types of negotiation even uh, admitting peace builders and environmental activists, which may indeed be something that will give us much more richness, but can also be somewhere where you might lose some of uh, those who identify themselves truly on a humanitarian front line. And this was also uh, discussed last night, whether that richness will bring us together or whether that richness uh, risks to fray at the edges because the community gets so large. Uh, how do you then uh, guarantee confidentiality and exchange of uh, those kernels that really can help us in hard states uh, to be negotiating access, uh, to be negotiating ways via uh, checkpoints, uh, access to populations, etc. On the generalized negotiation, my personal opinion is that it, it doesn't actually matter as much as we might like to think it does. And I think this sort of comes back to some of this, this tension between the, the formal, what did we want to get out of this and what did we build as, an, as a founding group versus where are we going with this down the road? And um, I think that the uh, differences in ideology, in approach, in values uh, of many of the organizations involved also creates uh, some risk if we are trying to figure out how to be more 
coordinated in our approach to uh, negotiations, which was also mentioned in, in finding how do we keep that, that separate space. And then I think something that's not been mentioned, but something that we certainly hold very dear, is how do we bring this and what are the risks and the constraints involved when we're really coming at the hard end, not the broad negotiation end, but the critical incident management, uh, the managing with kidnappings, uh, the use of force, and we'll be discussing tomorrow kidnap and ransom. Uh, it, I think it's tomorrow or Tuesday. Yeah, tomorrow is Tuesday. Um, we have very different approaches uh, between UN organizations, uh, between charities, between more classic humanitarians. And then we get into, and this is an area that I think we need to uh, deal with because we're dealing with it institutionally. When it comes to data protection and the new rules around GDPR, when it comes to counter-terror measures, different state legislations, which will not permit certain types of interaction with people who are blacklisted, let alone dialogue, much less unintentional cooperation or coordination or, or uh, negotiation. And uh, so those are a few, I think, of the generalized risks. Uh, what, I, what I believe and what I hope and what I'm sure we're going to find is, is this marriage between the two. Interestingly enough, uh, Grania feels this space allows everyone to relax. I think for MSF, it's almost the opposite. Uh, and we might be good with the, the, the formalized tools, but are struggling with the informal value and how to marry the two. And I think that will be uh, part of the way forward. And I look forward to the dialogues this week that hopefully we'll find the crystals of that. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Stephen. Um, precisely because there are the risks and constraints, it's good that we're here talking about them. And it's only in conversation that we can continue to grow. And thank you for pointing out that actually some of the risks and constraints might not just come from the failures of difficulties, but actually from the successes themselves. And uh, I heard once there are two obstacles to progress. One is failure, the other is success. And it's the second one that's the most difficult. But uh, thank you for laying that out. Um, I'd like to go back now to one of our panelists online, Parvati uh, Ramaswamy from the World Food Program in Afghanistan, where she's the Deputy Country Director and of Program and Operations. Are you, are you with us? Looks like you are, fantastic. Um, we've been hearing a lot about collaboration today, as you see, it's the hot topic. And we were actually invited by David Katrud from World Food Program to expand the definition of collaboration also with the community. So how would you say a collaborative culture can contribute to building trust? Another word we've been talking about, of all counterparts, national NGOs and local communities. And what would you say is also the lack of, the impact of a lack of collaboration on these stakeholders? Thank you for being with us. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Reinhard, and good morning to everyone, uh, my fellow panel members. Um, coming after three or four panelists is very easy because you see a lot of uh, things that you identify as one of the key speaking points have been covered. So I just don't want to repeat some of the things, but what I definitely want to add uh, to the co-creation, to collaboration, to coordination and cooperation is the fact that there is such a big human element um, in this whole process of humanitarian collaboration. We are talking about people, their fear, their courage, and their behaviors that can make or break uh, negotiations. So what I wanted to start with was a very small example from Afghanistan, where we do have interagency mechanism uh, for humanitarian collaboration. So we have the Humanitarian Access Working Group, which constitutes uh, UN agencies, uh, our NGO partners, donor partners, etc. So for policy and strategic discussions, this is a great collaboration platform because engagement, communication, dialogue amongst this group is really, really good. And it also builds trust over a period of time uh, when you're discussing common issues, trends and patterns that emerge because of challenges uh, in Afghanistan. But I also want to look at trust in a way with known partners, known actors, versus those in a shifting context like Afghanistan, when people arm themselves, then you don't know anymore uh, uh, who you want to negotiate with and who you want to talk to, because they may not be trusting you at all. So we are also talking about trust in a context which is so fast evolving that anything that you might do could be construed or misconstrued by any party to conflict. So we are also talking about linking um, how much fear and courage the frontline negotiators need to have to be able to uh, negotiate access or any other challenges. In terms of collaboration itself, I think people want to collaborate. 
but processes should not stifle them. So we should be very conscious that when we talk about these tensions between institutional autonomy, agency-specific sensitivities versus what we collaborate as a group, what we agree as common tactics, how do we balance that? And I did hear my fellow panelists talk about um, what kind of uh, um, information sharing is actually happening on the ground. Are everybody contributing to full disclosure or not? Are there any specific operational independence issues that may disallow at the operational field office level for people to collaborate and actually work together? So the fracture that we see is probably more in practice and in um, tactics than so much in policy or strategy discussions at the level of the humanitarian access group or any other collaboration point. For me, the negative impacts of collaboration is when there's a perception that unprincipled actions have taken place on the ground. This could be due to various reasons. It could be because one way to stay and deliver could be that some compromise has been made. Then what will happen is that parties to conflict can say, this is a precedent, so we want to make it a norm. So please conform to whatever somebody did. So at practice, when we don't see coherence, then we don't see co-creation of solutions, then the fragmentation happens because then you are already losing the, um, I would say, balance and the win-win focus of the negotiation. So what we need to watch out for is how do we translate what has been agreed in policy and practice to all our frontline negotiators who are really exposed to it on a daily basis and challenges are not uh, same. Today there will be a checkpoint, tomorrow there will be an extortion, the day after tomorrow somebody's going to say, uh, please recruit so and so from this team because we want to make sure uh, they are part of what you're doing in terms of humanitarian assistance. So I think that sensitivity has to be observed at all times because we are talking about whole different types of people who are in different camps with different interests, needs, positions, and postures. So for me, what is really, really important is how we are shifting our focus from individual skill building, which CCHN has really, really contributed to do, how to build this network of practitioners and how they share and exchange knowledge. But at the same time, what is it that we need to do that may contribute to autonomy of agencies and the sensitivity of information and how they have the standard operating procedures and train their staff who are frontline staff, whether it's supply chain staff or program staff or monitoring staff, how they can manage when a certain type of incident happens and what will be the escalation protocols. But it may not be enough because if coherence and cohesion is not perceived, then we are opening ourselves to being pushed away from principled approach. We may have joint operating principles which have been shared by uh, shared within our own uh, uh, operators, but also with the parties to conflict. But the critical aspect is what happens when the same party is dealing with different actors who have to reach assistance, who have an accountability for resources provided, and the perceived differences can cause mistrust. I also believe that if communities see inconsistency in behaviors and in practice, they will stop collaborating and they will mistrust humanitarian partners and actors. Ultimately, we do not want to harm the people that we are assisting. We also want to make sure that their acceptance to what we do is consistent and it's just not WFP's acceptance approach alone, but anybody who is stating what they are here for and that consistency is maintained, there is a very, very high chance that collaboration will really be uh, successful and we can continue to mitigate some of the risks uh, that may either be a lessons learned from the failure or a lessons learned from uh, a success. I would also like to point out one particular um, aspect uh, which I have found um, partly successful, I would say, in the short stint that I did as the humanitarian coordinator in Afghanistan last year. When you have a resident coordinator or a humanitarian coordinator who acts on behalf of the partners he or she is representing and takes a delegation for negotiation rather than interpret and understand from his or own perspective what needs to be done, 
the success of it will be minimal. I think when a humanitarian coordinator consults and broadly takes on issues and takes a team to negotiate so that the party with whom we are negotiating hears different voices, uh, looks at the, I think the vibes and the urgency of the situation, then it's much more um, successful when you have this cross-party uh, delegation-oriented negotiation as well. So for me, collaboration takes so many different forms, but we need to always keep in center the people who are entrusted with that, be it a very small, you know, how to overcome a checkpoint challenge issue to how are we going to negotiate a big issue like who are the people we need to access and how come we are not getting access and it becomes across the country issue. For me, the courage, the fear, understanding of how these can play very much into the confidence of negotiation is something that we really, really must be uh, keeping in mind when we are deliberating different thematic areas in the, la in the next uh, uh, few days at this uh, summit. I Thank really believe that this is what I think we need to intersperse across uh, um, different aspects of negotiation. So thank you very much, Rainer. Thank you so much for, for reminding us who we're collaborating for and why we're even having these discussions and ultimately who we want to be collaborating with to make that happen. Um, I would like to stay online and now pass it on to David Harland, the Executive Director of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, also one of the partners of CCHN. And David, you've heard a lot about the challenges that we've been speaking about so far. Uh, how do you categorize the, the obstacles that we have here and any suggestions on how we can co to overcome them and, and get this collaboration right? David, thank you for being with us. Great, Reiner, thank you very much, yeah. And um, yeah, great location. I must say I, um, uh, I associate in my mind co uh, precisely with uh, sort of an, an effort to find moral purpose you know, in a world of real interests, which are not always very, very admirable. I mean, going right back to to uh, the moral disarmament uh, days and then the Cold War. So um, thank you for that inspiration. I, I think, you know, I see we're running out of time. So I just want to make three very quick points. The first is I very much agree um, with uh, the point made by others of the need to sort of put principles and collaboration over, over institutions. Uh, the second and main point I want to make is that's really, really hard <laughs> in practice, and, and I think much harder perhaps than uh, has even been put on the table. And, and third is that's precisely why we uh, need CCHN and, and why it's so great to be here. So on, on the first point, yes, I mean, from um, Barbara Koffler and Peter Maurer, you know, the balance you know, moving beyond institutions and we shouldn't see our missions in institutional um, terms. And David Cartrude, you know, let's focus on the strategic coherence, you know. And absolutely, I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't agree uh, more. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, perhaps as my main point, uh, the second one here, that you know, we can start by um, looking in the mirror um, and uh, and then figure out a, a path ahead. You know, and I don't think we we have to be ashamed about it. I think you know we we work on you know um, uh, conflicts around the world, and one thing that strikes all of us who work in those conflicts is how the parties are constantly realigning, not according to their stated principles, but according to their, uh, their interests. You know, many of you, you know, in uh, Libya, for example, you know, there is Field Marshal Hefter, you know, saying that he's fighting for a secular Libya, you know, in open alignment with the Madkalists, you know, the, the, you know, the most radical of, of, the, of the Islamist uh, groups operating there. In Syria, it's the weirdest uh, combination. There have been moments where the regime uh, in Damascus has um, been covertly supporting ISIS. The uh, Al-Qaeda, or at least uh, HTS, uh, no longer Al-Qaeda, uh, is in some form of collaboration with the uh, Western uh, countries. Um, and in Afghanistan, of course, Iran has found some common interests with uh, uh, with the Taliban. Uh, and I think, um, you know, 
all of this reminds us. I mean, we we always assume that we are on a on on a higher moral level, and and I um, I do hope we 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 really do believe, and and I think we do. The, the, the the higher principles to which we stand, but uh, but I think many of the people we interact with on the ground would equally believe that that they are committed to a, co- a cause, a cause defined by certain principles. And if you actually look at their hands as opposed to what they say, then in absolutely every case that I'm familiar with, from Ukraine to the southern Philippines. The characters are basically aligning according to interests, and um, and I just want to say that you know what is sometimes observed in our field is is true, and and we should not assume because we have such noble principles that we escape that dilemma. That the alignment of, or there is little alignment in fact between the the real incentives on some of our organizations and and the principles. So. I mean, the most obvious one is funding. You you need to stand out. You need to be uh, seen as a little different or better by by the funders, and that creates a, a set of incentives that, that are not always the um, uh, the most uh, the most noble of them. And I think that um, there's a lot of literature actually going back to Pavlov, but you know, with Kaufman and Tversky too, that that we do kid ourselves that we follow only our principles. Whereas when you actually follow behaviors, uh, you see that, in fact, we tend to follow our, our interests more. And and so without, you know, belaboring the point beyond that, though we could go into a little detail, I, I just want to end by saying that, you know, all the, the literature in, in psychology and, and sociology and, and my personal experience on the ground is that you know the only way out of that is regular, multi-level, interact, iterative engagement with the other other partners, and I, I couldn't agree more with David Cartwright about assessment, analysis, and strategic coherence. And I see you know the value where possible in precisely this network because. This network creates at every other level, from the strategic to really right that that checkpoint that we all keep talking about, a set of uh, a common community with its own values and identities and and so on. And my feeling is that if we are not constantly confronting the um, the fact that our interests do pull us in different directions, and we're not actively working through instruments like the uh, CCH. In, uh, to overcome that and, and to arrive at uh, a greater coherence, then uh, we do run the, the risk of slipping back. So um, I'm, uh, to me, it's so valuable that you're holding the summit and um, it gives us an opportunity first to look in the mirror and uh, second, having looked in the mirror, uh, to start developing the, the, the common identities and common purpose that the, the literature sh- shows us is the prerequisite for moving beyond the, the narrowest of, of interest that uh, Ms. Koffler told us about in, in the very first uh, intervention and which has been a thread throughout all of this. So uh, congratulations to CCHN and look forward to the discussion from here. Thank you very much, David, for the important reminder to take the look in the mirror, to take a look around, and to do that also collectively. Um, and now I would like to pass on to Ambassador Jörg Lauber, the permanent representative of Switzerland to the UN, uh, who will also be joining us online, and ask him to help tie this all together and see where do we go from here? Uh, what next steps are there for designing collaborative approaches to global humanitarian challenges. Great to have you. It seems you're in Geneva, or at least that's what your image shows, but glad to have you here, Ambassador. Thank you much, uh, Reiner, and good morning to everybody. I am actually in Geneva. The, uh, the representative to the UN is in New York. I've been there. Uh, I've been in Geneva since September. I was in New York before. But it's a, a great pleasure and an honor for me to be in this event. And I want to thank uh, Claude and his team for organizing it. And I also don't want to start before um, really expressing my, my deepest uh, respect and, and appreciation 
to all the frontline humanitarian negotiators that are with us in this event, be it there in co or uh, in, in the chat, in the rooms, in the virtual room from around the world. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing and I wish you good luck with your important uh, endeavors wherever you are. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll be able to uh, draw all the conclusions of the, of the talks or of the presentations this morning. Um, I'm actually, to be honest, uh, mostly here to listen and I did learn a lot, but I appreciate also the opportunity to say a few words and I want to concentrate on four issues. First, on the role of, of Switzerland and, and of Geneva in this. As you know, as Claude mentioned, Switzerland has supported the CCHN since, since, since its inception in, in 2016. And I actually remember in my previous capacity uh, talks with Claude on, on the possible setup of the center that go way uh, back uh, before the actual inception. Switzerland is very pleased how the center evolved. And uh, we're also particularly glad uh, to see that other countries uh, joined in this endeavor. We consider the center as an important asset in the humanitarian ecosystem here in Geneva. And as you've heard uh, from all speakers, I believe this morning, the provision of a, of a safe space for, for confidential exchanges among negotiators is, is most valuable. The center does offer to predict to practitioners this opportunity to share their experience and in this way I believe has created a broader and, and more inclusive community of practice across organizations in Geneva and of course beyond that. I, I thought very interesting uh, what Graeno O'Hara mentioned that uh, that's something that I didn't expect at least in the beginning. Not only does the center offer this safe space or relaxed room uh, for negotiators, frontline negotiators, but also to representatives of institutions to have this talk uh, between institutions. That brings me to my second point, the added value of the center. Um, we in Switzerland consider the partnership approach of the center and the objective to contribute jointly to, to better equip frontline negotiators as the really innovative element of this initiative. The practice of the center and the response and the engagement of practitioners that we see have confirmed this unique added value. Based on the feedback from the field, we have the impression that the center indeed has been able to contribute to better understanding the dynamics around humanitarian negotiations at the front lines. This is, and it was mentioned also by uh, colleagues this morning, this is essential for our ultimate goal, which is to improve the lives of affected people by gaining access by rendering humanitarian assistance and protection more efficient, and by fostering dialogue with authorities, armed groups, and communities. My third point is about the collaborative approach. Um, in our view, in Switzerland's view, there are two sets of questions here. One is about how humanitarian negotiators themselves can collaborate better and more efficiently. And it seems to me that the more we reach a common approach among negotiators, the stronger their position vis-a-vis -vis their interlocutors can be. The more negotiators learn from best practices, but also from failures, the better they can achieve improvements. The other set of questions is about how humanitarian negotiators can better interact with other actors, for example, in the field of peace promotion, development, or human rights. Often, humanitarian negotiators are crucial because they open the doors for initial contacts with other actors. Here, it seems important to us that collaboration takes place. For example, we met, as also mentioned this morning, common analysis of situations and relevant interlocutors. At the same time, we, of course, must recognize that the way impartial humanitarian actors work and negotiate is different or can be different from other actors. And finally, my fourth point is about the future of the CCHN. Five years on, the center has reached, we believe, an important point at the end of its inception phase. It has been tried and tested, and it certainly has shown its usefulness. In fact, the center has grown beyond expectations, at least beyond our expectations, and it will have to enlarge its donor base and adapt its managerial as well as governance schemes. And I was very happy to hear Peter Maurer's uh, vision for the future uh, in his introductory statement this morning, that the center intends fully to address both 
collaboration between institutions as well as between individuals, which includes, of course, the further strengthening of this unique community of practice that the center has so successfully created. So these a uh, few remarks from my side, and uh, I wish all of you a, a very successful continuation of this summit. And thanks again for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador Lauber. Now, we are slightly over time, but we'd like to briefly hear from you who've been in the chat and writing questions. So back to Hanalia, quick comment from you, and then we'll close. To the panelists. Um, so there were, there are more than 400 participants in the chat. So we're trying to make sense of these contributions, and, and there were some really strong reactions to the words of our panelists. Um, first, around diversity and how bringing more diversity, in particular gender diversity, will further this agenda of collaboration. It will reduce uh, the the need and the attitudes of competition that we sometimes encounter at the field level. Um, also, strong reaction and strong calling for more trust. Trust at the CCHN um, uh, as as a collaborative platform does enable, uh, and we need more of this uh, at field level and also amongst the senior most levels of, of the, the humanitarian agencies that are here today. Um, and um, I would like to go back to a question, maybe open up a, a bit the, the, the reasoning for the panelists. Beyond this initial line of questioning around what practical platforms can we put in place to further this global agenda, but also to look at the very context level, you know, in the countries at the subnational levels, there were a couple of questions from our participants around how do you reflect and think around risk management and the response to risks that uh, the frontline negotiators are exposed to and expose themselves and their families to in order to further this collaborative agenda and this need for more collaboration in negotiation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, apologies that we don't have more time to go into depth with all of these questions. So what I've asked our panelists is just two of them to give a brief, uh, very, very brief conclusion. And of course, the questions will be those that we take on in the uh, roundtables and are out during the rest of the week. But first, I'll ask Peter and then Grania to give us our final remarks. Thanks a lot. Uh, no conclusion, but uh, a couple of uh, Brief remarks. First, I was intrigued by Grant's uh, mentioning of falling in between the cracks. And I do believe that what we are discussing today is really how collaboration can pick up what falls in between the cracks of institutional cooperations and setups. And I think when we look at the best possible platform, I don't know, but if we look at the crossroads of cooperation and collaboration, then I think CCHN has proven to be the place at the crossroad trying to organize the intersection of institutional cooperation and individual professional collaboration. And I think that's the place to go when you look for this. Second, uh, I wanted to highlight that we have heard a lot of polarities this morning. Is it uh, strategic cooperation and operational independence, principles and pragmatism, ideals and interests, transversal and specific, uh, collaborative coordinating individual and institutional? These have been sort of polarities in which we are oscillating. And what I would propose for further conversations is that we don't look at these polarities as just juxtapositions, but as framing the debate. We are all oscillating between those different polarities. And I, at times we put the cursor and the foot on different places on that cursor. And I think what is critical is to have a debate which is evidence-based, which is experience-based, which listens to people concerned, and in the light of evidence, experience, and our overall commitment to service people affected by war, conflict, humanitarian disasters, in the light of this, we test where to put down the foot, where to put the cursor. And I think that's a more sort of fruitful maybe way forward than speaking about 
exclusivity. And that's maybe my last point with regard to platforms. I think what CCHN is today and what it might be over the next couple of years, we have heard a couple of things this morning, but whether the transversality of issues is more dominant or the proliferation of contextual platforms which brings frontline negotiators in more contextual ways together. That will be determined by interest of frontline negotiators, by the pressure of problems, by the reaction of communities, by the issues we are dealing with. And I think it's the wrong way of thinking about where is the best platform. We will see multiple platforms emerge. And the question is, where do you go for a specific type of questions you are dealing with, whether it is risk, whether it is uh, something else. But CCHN, I think, once again, is ideally placed to respond to transversal issues of collaboration in a context of institutions uh, which are dominating the humanitarian world. And that's where I see uh, our discussion first and foremost uh, moving. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Granier, you have uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds after, after it was so articulately wrapped up. Um, look, if I, if I look at it exclusively, uh, it being um, what UNHCR feels it has contributed and also gotten out of the CCHN uh, relationship. If I look at it exclusively through the eyes of, of those UNHCR colleagues who have participated in what the centre has to offer, I would say it has been definitely positive. I mean, there, there's no question about it. That's the feedback. As I sit here this morning and I listen and I ponder and I hear what others are saying and perspectives that I hadn't necessarily thought about, particularly what you were saying, that, I mean, maybe there's a risk in getting, in getting too big, in getting too broad, that then we lose some of our focus. And just hearing what Peter uh, was saying about evidence-based, and maybe I'm finishing on a, a, a more mundane and structural note than what Peter has just given us. But we have just uh, not so long ago finished with the uh, evaluation process that we jointly all committed to. And that, as founding members, has given us some evidence to reflect upon and upon which to move forward not only about the structures, but about each of our individual role and contribution. And of course, um, important things like predictable and stable funding on a fair basis. So I think uh, in the same way that you've said, um, Peter, that uh, the centre itself is at a crossroads of, you know, it's, it's a place of choice where people can come. It's not the exclusive platform. There are other offers out there, but it has proved itself through the cooperation, collaboration and commitment of a core set of partners to be a good place to go um, on issues of uh, capacity around negotiation. I would say structurally also, so we're at a bit of a crossroads as, as, uh, as founding members and, and as partners, and we do have the basis of the evaluation and everything we learn from each other, including what's going to come out from this forum, um, to allow us to decide on, on certain key elements moving forward. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We are also at a crossroads. It is time to end this high-level segment. Um, the conversation has officially begun it will continue in the roundtables. There will be a little break now, of course. They start again at 11 Central European time. And uh, of course, throughout the rest of the week, there will be wonderful conversations. Thank you again for having gotten us thinking, asking even more questions. And uh, we look forward to continue to ask those questions together. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. And uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.